Cool. Well, uh, thanks very much for having me, everyone. Um, I'm the only thing standing between you and freedom now. Um, uh, so, uh, firstly, um, yeah, I would say you guys have been pretty quiet, I think, so far this workshop. Um, but please, like, feel free to interrupt and ask questions at any point. I think it will be uh, more interesting and fun. And also, you know, the things build on each other. So if you don't understand something at the beginning, um, try and clarify it so the rest of the talk makes sense. Um, uh, yeah, I, um, I don't really need to go over this too much because it was mentioned in the introduction. But I was just going to, so I know some people here work on spikes and some people come from more machine learning backgrounds and um, cognitive science backgrounds. Um, and so, you know, I've kind of uh, played a little bit in all of these fields. And, you know, um, so I hope that maybe I can put some insights from them together. Um, and also, I've tried to be a little bit provocative or uh, include some opinions, especially later in the talk. Um, and those opinions are my own, not always my employers. Um, and in particular, at any big company, it's, you know, I think it's very healthy that we have lots of different uh, viewpoints on um, what the right approach is. Uh, there's probably a, like a little bit more maths and a little bit uh, less philosophy than some of the other talks. Um, uh, that's just because I don't have the attention span to understand deep concepts. So I work on very concrete things. Um, and my goal, I hope, is that obviously I can't cover every detail, but I, I want to try and um, kind of give you a feel for what's happening in the field of deep reinforcement learning, which is maybe one of the most scalable approaches we have right now for really making uh, learning robots. And I hope that you'll come away both being aware of like uh, kind of the current tools and the progress that has been made, and also some of the limitations and active areas of research. Um, and yeah, I think if you come away with both these ideas, um, that will be great. And I'm not too worried if, you know, the very specific algorithm, you know, maybe you need to research a bit more, but I hope that you come away with the ideas of where these can be useful and, and where interesting research directions. Um, and so the outline of the talk is, uh, yeah, firstly, I'm just going to give, um, so it's been a challenge because I know from talking to you, there's lots of different backgrounds here. Um, and so I've tried to make sure there's something for everyone. Um, so some of the beginning of the talk, I'm going to start on some very basic stuff that I'm sure many of you are, are very aware of. Um, I'm just going to ex very explain uh, neural networks as I conceive them and as we need to know for deep RL. Then I'm going to cover uh, the basic ideas of reinforcement learning, um, some of, and then, and then uh, some of the successes in deep RL, uh, and then a specific algorithm. I'll go into some detail that I worked on that's... Um, been used quite a bit in robotics. Um, and then uh, and then I'm going to look at, so, you know, uh, where are all the robots in our lives um, and what's what's missing from the current um, approaches. Um, and then I'm going to talk about successive features. And then I have tons of slides, so if there's still tons of time, we can go into some extensions to the EPG that try and um, resolve some of the issues. But uh, I'm not wor worried about covering everything. Um, so probably won't get to that. Um, and also, I don't necessarily cite all historical examples or like a fair sample of the field. Um, as I said, I'm trying to give you an eclectic feel for what's going on. Um, so it's not like a full review, and I'm sure I missed like lots of uh, relevant work. Uh, okay, so to start with, um, how many people, does everyone here kind of conceptually understand neural networks? Yes, no? Who, who feels like they understand neural networks? Raise your hand. OK, so it's like half, I think. Um, so let me just give you a, a very, very simple idea. Many of you probably did this in high school or even undergrad. Imagine that we have to predict. We have a data set that is basically um, a house price, a quite cheap house for London, and then some features. These features might be things like the size of the house, uh, the size of the yard, the location. Um, but we encode them in some numbers, right? Um, and then we want to, from this data set, which you know, may have many more than two entries, we'd like to make a predictor um, so that given the properties of a new house, we can guess what we should put it up for sale at. And the really basic idea is we just define a loss function, which says like, uh, essentially what we care about. So this is saying we care about the squared error between the, um, the prediction, the actual house price, y, and the prediction of the house price. So we want to minimize uh, that squared error. 
Um, and then really after that, uh, we, we build a predictor, which in this case is just a linear function. We just say like, we take each of these features um, and we weight it linearly and we add some offset. Um, and that's how we're gonna predict house prices. Um, and then from here, so, okay, so the issue is now we need to learn the parameters, these weights, uh, W and B, so that we can actually make predictions about new houses. And then very simply, we just uh, apply the chain rule you learned in high school um, to minimize the loss. And this sum is over all the entries in our data set. So here we have two entries, so the sum would have two terms. But in general, this might have like hundreds of thousands of terms. Uh, and then well, one way we can solve this problem, obviously many of you know that you can solve this specific case in closed form. But one way we can solve this problem is just iteratively compute the gradient. So compute, if I change the weights in this way, um, how will it change the loss? Uh, and then keep applying, um, subtracting that, uh, a very small step of that gradient from our weights, and eventually we'll find some um, minimum uh, set. So that really is um, all that neural networks are doing. Uh, but of course, um, these linear predictors are not very powerful, so one of the key ideas of, that make neural networks powerful is really that you, um, you have nonlinear functions and you chain them together. So this is where the deep and deep neural networks comes from. It's the idea that the, our predictors are made of, of these like um, functions which are recursive um, and tend to have many layers. And then another big idea which is very important for why neural networks have been very successful in image recognition is just the idea of convolutional neural networks um, which basically says instead of, um, so it, it captures the idea that if you're trying to find a goat in an image that um, you know, if you move the goat here, it still looks like a goat. And, you, um, and so rather than treating each inch pixel in this image independently, um, we uh, convolve weights. So we, um, we compute like uh, a, a, the same set of weights reapplied at each position in the image. So if we had like a goat detector, we apply it here, we apply it here, we apply it here, and we generate a layer of um, activations, which is essentially, um, if we had a goat detector, it would essentially say there's a goat here and there's a goat here. Um, and so it captures this idea of translation invariant. And um, it turns out that you can compute these things very efficiently. And this is a big part of why neural networks have been um, very, uh, essentially they're almost the only thing used now in a lot of image recognition systems. Um, um, but again, all of this is trained really just like the slide before, just following the chain rule and computing gradients for each of the weights. Um, and of course, many of you know there's like um, clever algorithms that are very efficient about computing these weights. Um, and so for the, for the rest of this talk, and really mostly what we do in deep reinforcement learning, is um, there's many active, uh, we're not really necessarily trying to innovate in the area of neural networks. The key idea is that um, we, we have these function approximators, which have a set of weights, which now I've collapsed like all the W's and B's into this one term theta. Um, that, so they take an input and they generate an output and they're parameterized by this term theta. And given some loss function, so given some error that we care about, we know lots of algorithms to, for how to find th the value of theta that minimizes or approximately minimizes that error. So essentially, for our purposes, a neural network is a function with a set of weights that we know how to train to minimize a loss function if we have enough examples or data. Um, and of course, you know, there's a, it's a whole active area of research, but for our purposes, that's all we need to know. Okay, what about reinforcement learning? How many people know that, just like the, the basic uh, formalism of reinforcement learning? Mm, I should say it's like 50-50 again. Um, so uh, reinforcement learning is again, a very uh, general um, concept that, uh, can be applied in many different problems. Um, and the key formalism is that uh, we design agents and they interact with the environment. And the way they interact is in a very specified way that they receive from the environment two things, the state of the world um, and a reward. Uh, um, and in return, they get to choose an action and this affects the environment, and then they get a new state and a new reward. Um, and so, you know, we get this like sequence here. 
um, where you t ha start in state action one, we, uh, we start in a state, we take an action, we receive a reward, we end up in a new state, and you, you get these sequences. And the goal of reinforcement learning, um, I'm leaving out um, uh, discounting and terminations here. Um, the goal of reinforcement learning is just to maximize, to find um, actions which maximize the return, where it's the sum, of the, the sum total of the rewards we receive. Um, and so what makes, um, what makes reinforcement learning challenging is that we care about the total of the rewards, not the immediate reward, right? So um, when you're playing a chess game, you care about winning the game, not losing a pawn. And so this is why chess is hard, and you know, um, is because the actions you take now might lose a pawn now, but help you win the game later. And so it's very important to, um, the, essentially the central challenge of reinforcement learning is to figure out the long-term consequences of your actions. Um, and it's also hard in value assignment because if you win a chess game, um, you know, it's very hard to know which of, maybe you made some mistakes, maybe you made some weak moves, um, but nonetheless you got lucky and you won the game. And so it's, um, it's also challenging when you win the game to know which of your actions you should uh, assign, um, should take credit for winning the game. You can win the game even though you made a mistake. Um, and there's a, another very important property of reinforcement uh, learning models which makes it tractable which is that we assume the environment is Markovian, which means that the only thing we need to know about um, in order to make the optimal action is the current state. We can forget the past. Um, you can see that's a, that's a big approximation. Um, uh, however, you can trivially make this true in the sense of if you just keep your, your entire history as your state, right? Then, then trivially that means that your state captures everything you know about the world, but obviously that's computationally uh, challenging. Um, yeah, so formally, uh, um, uh, there's like a formal definition of reinforcement learning that I won't go into. Um, some of you probably did control theory, um, which you, you, know, you would have seen a similar formalism. Um, in control theory, they usually use x for the states and u for the actions. Um, and I would say really the big difference between control theory and reinforcement learning is largely an emphasis. So they're actually, um, oh yeah, sorry, and also in control theory, they typically look at costs, which is just the negative of the reward, uh, negative of the return. Um, so in control theory, typically you're interested in environments where you know a perfect model of that environment, or you assume you know, and then you want to um, find optimal policies given that you know the environment. Whereas in reinforcement learning, typically we're interested in environments which we don't know the full properties of the environment. That's part of the challenge of learning. Um, uh, yeah, actually, I think I, yeah, and, um, oh, sorry, one other piece of terminology you're going to hear um, is just uh, a policy. And that's just um, a formal, that's just a function which maps from a given state to a distribution over action. So it's a distribution because um, you, it doesn't need to be deterministic. For a given state, your policy might choose like, you know, actions a bit at random. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so then the return becomes this expectation over, um, uh, and there's two sources of uh, um, variance in this return. So one is the environment might be stochastic. Like if you do the same thing every time in an environment, you might get different outcomes. Um, and secondly, the policy itself might be stochastic, that given the same state of the environment, it may take a big different action. Um, and we're interested in how do we learn policies which get us a good return. Um, and I just want to emphasize here that this is a very, very general framework. Like, almost all problems, I think, uh, can be termed in terms of a reinforcement learning problem. Um, so, you know, DeepMind is, is fairly well known for playing games um, like Atari games. You can see these fit very clearly in reinforcement learning where you're, you're playing a game, your goal is to get the highest score, um, so that's your reward, and the actions are clearly the actions you can take in the game. Um, but there's many other things. Recommendation systems can be uh, framed in this way. So, you know, if you, uh, you go to a website, um, the actions it can can do are things like uh, what uh, items will it recommend to you and the reward can be if you're satisfied if you click on those items um, then you know maybe that's considered the reward um, 
uh, yeah, there's lots of uh, complex systems optimization. So most problems can be framed as part of reinforcement learning. And uh, obviously, again, as many of you know, um, humans and animals uh, can be well modeled in certain simple situations by reinforcement learning. Um, there's been a lot of study. In fact, the original ideas of reinforcement learning came from behavioral studies in animals. Um, and also, uh, reinforcement learning has been used um, by like Shane Lake in formal definitions of what it means to be intelligent, where intelligence is loosely defined as the ability to f find good policies over lots of different kinds of environments. So, you know, a, a concrete definition of this sort of um, used to deep mind is uh, you can, in some ways, measure someone's intelligent by putting them, making them play lots of different games or putting them in lots of different situations and seeing if they're in each of these situations able to find um, solutions which uh, uh, provide them reward. Um, and so here are some of the kind of um, successes of reinforcement learning, if I can figure out how to play them. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. So these are two Atari games. Um, and so here, um, the, so this is a computer playing the game. Um, and you can see it does pretty well. Um, but what's important is obviously people have been able to sit down and write a, a bot that plays a game for a very long time, right? That, that's not that hard to do. What's important here is that um, in these algorithms, the only thing that the humans provide is the algorithm itself for learning. Um, and all of, and it, nothing about the specifics of each game. So each game is just learned by playing the game many, many times, uh, watching the images and watching the rewards you get uh, and figuring out how to maximize the score. Um, and so you can train on a, a new game um, without knowing even how to play the game yourself. Um, and so that's the key idea. Um, you know, you could sit down and write by hand a bot very easily. Uh, and so, uh, some of you are probably also aware that uh, there's been some successes in the game of uh, Go, which is a bit like chess, but um, much harder to, for, has traditionally been much harder for um, computers to play because it's been very difficult to um, evaluate which good board positions are good and which board positions are bad. Um, you know, and human masters, uh, generally have this intuition, they can look at the board and they can just tell you that's a good move, that's a bad move. And if you say why, it's very hard to, for them to explain why because if you, if you, I guess some of you have probably done traditional game theory, if you try and build like a, a full search tree of the future states of this game, it's I incredibly dense because you, you often have about 300 possible moves at each state. So it's like you can't iteratively compute, am I going to win the game? Instead, you need to... Um, you need to develop kind of an intuitions about what's a good move. Um, and so there was uh, successes uh, recently at this. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say, really, like the reason I, this, um, this work was quite important <coughs> is it was one of the, m um, so there's some earlier work, but it's, you know, uh, since the, so deep neural networks kind of really started being successful in like 2011, 2012, and uh, image recognition. Um, and so this was, this really kind of kicked off the, these results really kind of kicked off the field of deep reinforcement learning because they were the first in kind of recent history with uh, modern computing to show that you could successfully combine the um, power of deep learning, the ability to actually learn directly from images um, with reinforcement learning techniques. Um, and so, uh, you know, up, up until this time, really a lot of reinforcement learning had been on very simple worlds um, and from very simple state spaces. And so the, the success of this sort of um, kind of created a subfield in, uh, in deep learning and RL of, you know, how do we combine these two really powerful ideas together? Yeah, I have a question about the etymology. Uh, what, why reinforcement and why deep? <clears throat> ah, okay, so deep, it's a good question. So um, deep refers to the fact, so deep, ref, deep reinforcement learning refers to the fact, sorry, I'm just trying to go back to find it. Uh, so the deep comes from deep neural networks. Um, and that, that, that deepness just means that you have um, many, like, um, the neural network you're learning has many layers with many nonlinearities. So, in other words, this has three layers, right? You have this basic function, but with different weights, applied three times, right? And so, 
I mean, you, there's no like clear boundary of where you consider your neural network deep, but um, the deep neural networks kind of came about because as you make your networks deeper, traditionally they became harder and harder to train. And also computers were slower. Um, and so a lot of neural network research really only looked at like one or two layer neural networks uh, until recently when now uh, I think image net models often have 30 layers or 100 layers in some crazy cases. Um, and what that gives them is a huge representational capacity, right? They have a lot of weights. They can learn really complicated functions from high dimensional input, like um, images or sound waves directly, rather than needing to pre-process them. So that's the deep. Does that make sense? Uh, and the reinforcement learning, that's a good, uh, good question. I think this maybe comes from behavioralism, but I'm not so sure about this, uh, where um, the term came, the idea that, uh, you know, if you're training uh, your pet, you reinforce behaviors by, like, when it does something you like, you give it, um, you know, a, a treat. Uh, and so then it reinforces. It tells it, oh, keep doing that behavior, because whenever you do this, you get a treat. Okay. Uh, and now, um, obviously, we're not too interested in playing computer games here. We're more interested in embodiment, robots. Um, and so here's some... Hopefully these videos play some simulated. Uh, so this is some work I worked on, and this is some follow-up work from it. Um, so this is simulated in just a physics simulator. This is like a classic um, cart pole. Um, and you can see, uh, again, what's important about this is that each of these um, environments is, not, is learned with like the same algorithm and the same hyperparameters. So you're not changing. It's relearning in each environment, but the human doesn't have to kind of tell it about each environment. Um, and uh, maybe I'll skip some of it. Yeah, you can balance these things. This is all in simulation. Um, uh, right. But I guess the other important thing is with, um, so you know, a lot of those tasks were kind of classic RL tasks. You balance a cart ball. Um, but importantly, now we can start to do these things in, um, from pixels. So rather than having like a low dimensional description, like the angle of each joint, now um, in, this, in this version we are solving these things just from looking at the environment um, from pixels, which was, used to be much more challenging to do. And that allows you to do more interesting tasks where you don't have a really simple description of the environment, like um, play a racing game uh, where um, you, know, you need to actually look out the Look, look at the screen and figure out what to do. You don't have like a, um, a low dimensional version. So this is, uh, this is what the, the agency is, which is essentially just a, low uh, a down sampled um, version of the screen. And, it, and you can see it's roughly able to drive OK. Um, but again, that's still all in simulation. Uh, here's a follow up work um, by some other people at DeepMind um, where this is a real robot uh, and they. They're trying to do what in robotics is quite a challenging task, which is insert a, um, a I don't know what you call that, insert this thing um, in, uh, in a box. And it's quite a tight fit. And it actually is a bit springy. So like, it's quite challenging in the sense that um, it, need, it has quite tight tolerances. And sometimes you need to um, pull it out a bit. Um, and uh, you know, they were able to successfully learn this. Oh, maybe. Uh, and it can even do things like here recover, see it went in a bit wrong, like on a bit of the wrong angle, and it kind of pulled out a little bit and then went back in again. Um, and the thing they added here is that it's the similar algorithm to this work, um, which is DDPG, which I'll discuss later. However, um, now they have human demonstrations first. So the, the, as well as just getting to try, the robot also gets to see some examples of a human um, who's controlling the robot doing the task. So you had a question. Um, was uh, this also trained in, in simulation or tr just uh, in real life? This was just trained in real life, but with demonstrations. Um, so the demonstrations are important because, and we'll get to this in a lot more detail later, because um, they let it be much more data efficient. So uh, you know, if you trained completely from scratch, it would spend a lot of time waving its arm in the air with you know, no idea what to do, um, where demonstrations sort of at least show it, OK, you get a reward if you do this goal, and so it knows kind of approximately what it should be trying to achieve. Any other questions? Um, and 
another simulation just showing more recent uh, work um, that we can really, this is all in simulation, but these are, are really um, like complex uh, morphologies. Um, and again, the same algorithm is being used across each. Uh, and you can see, well, it's going to get more complex as we go along, but it's learning like non-trivial behaviors. It's not just walking. It has to learn to like jump walls. Uh, sometimes these are quite high and challenging. Um, and again, it's not told how to do this. It's just given a reward for achieving forward velocity. Um, how long is this? Okay, maybe I'll skip. Uh, there's the ant. Uh, and maybe the most challenging um, is the humanoid. Okay, that's not the best video. Uh, so it's, so one, one thing, and we'll get to this later, you can see it, it actually walks a bit funny, and this is partly because this is probably not, <laughs> not a perfect model of, uh, you know, like a humanoid. But it's also because, and, and we'll get to this later, the only reward it cares about is making forward progress, right? It doesn't care about how it looks. It doesn't have a, you know, um, the reward doesn't say try and look a bit more like a normal person. It just says run. Um, and yeah, so energetic constraints are, are one thing you can add. Um, but uh, I think there's, yeah, there's some evidence that it's also just um, kind of the closer the models become physically to humans, uh, then, then they tend to start to look more realistic. Um, so in particular, we have, I, I guess many of you know this more than me, we have like quite springy joints. So part of our, the way we walk is because we reabsorb a lot of energy each time. And um, a lot of humanoid models don't really capture this um, springiness. Uh, yeah. This was actually featured by uh, is it, um, Stephen, no, John Stewart, I think, on his show. Uh, but they added some funny sound effects, which I'm probably not allowed to show you here. <laughs> okay, so now I, we go into some more details about the algorithm that underlies several of those uh, videos, not, not all of them. Um, it's a specific algorithm that I worked on that has generally performed well in robotics. Um, and it's relatively simple. Um, and so there's been a lot of follow-up work that add various features to this, including um, some other work that if I have time, I'll get to. Um, and importantly, uh, this is a bit of a, a detail, but um, a, lot of, a lot of reinforcement learning has been in actions with discrete action spaces, like Atari, where you have you know, uh, nine buttons or whatever. Um, whereas in robotics, typically, uh, you choose a torque on each of, or, or a velocity or a position goal on each of your actuators. And this is often well modeled as a continuous variable. Like, you know, you, you don't, um, and so, a lot of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms don't perform well in that setting because they um, sort of assume that it's pretty easy to uh, compute something for every possible action. Whereas if you have uh, like that, I don't know, 15, degree of free, 15 degrees of freedom humanoid and each of those actuators takes a number between minus one and one, then actually searching over that space is non-trivial. Um, and so DDPG deals well with this situation. Um, uh, how many of you know model free and model based? Okay, quite, quite small. So the other thing is in this whole talk, I'm really only talking about half of RL, um, and that's model free, which means that um, in some sense, we are going to learn how to maximize our return without ever building explicitly a model of the environment. So another approach, which I won't go into at all to reinforcement learning, is to is to look at how the world behaves and actually learn a model of it and then plan with this model. So you know, take your model of the world and think about how to um, plan. And this is also a, a very interesting area of research. That, um, I would say that in, in robotics, uh, most of the recent successes have been more in model free. Um, and this is because it's really, I think largely because it's been really hard to learn um, models which capture the dynamics of the world well enough that you can actually plan and learn interesting policies um, with them. Um, and, but there is substantial evidence that humans and animals use both model-free and model-based. Um, and you know, one way you can think about this is 
when you learn to ride a bike or you learn to do some complex task, often at the beginning, you're very conscious and you're actually planning like, you know, I'm going to make this movement and it will, you know, make the bike lean in this way or I'm kayaking and I, I'm going to do this. And and you think very consciously and you can see yourself planning about what will happen. But once you're very good at kayaking or very good at biking, you don't actually uh, you're not actually thinking like this anymore or driving, I guess, is another example. You just naturally, you know, in this situation, I will do this. And in some sense, you don't actually know why. Um, you just know that when I do this, good things happen. And if I don't do this, something bad will happen. Um, and so that's sort of more model free. I'm just going to try and learn what's good and what's bad, but I don't necessarily know why. Um, and that can sometimes make it harder to adapt to new goals or situations. If the dynamics of your world suddenly change, uh, you ride a very weird type of bike, then you might ta keep taking like the wrong actions because you don't have a model of why you take those actions. You just know that in general, they're a good idea. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. And in the long term, basically, we definitely want both. OK, so this is really the, the, the key con Well, one of the key concepts in model free reinforcement learning is the idea of value. Um, and really, it's just so remember before I said that when we doing reinforcement learning, what we care about is the long term return. We care about winning the game of chess or running a long distance, not what happens immediately. And so the value function tries to capture this by it's, a, it's saying um, it's policy dependent. Uh, and we, we'll be more clear about what that means now. It says, if I'm in a certain state and I take a certain action, um, then what is my ex expected return if, OK, after I take this action, I'm going to end up in a new state. And thereafter, I follow this policy. So I do whatever this policy tells me. Then what's the value of this action? And the value is the sum of the reward you're going to receive. Right? So it's, it's not just what, will ha what reward will I get for taking this action immediately, but what are the long-term consequences of this action? Um, and essentially, once you know this, um, everything becomes a lot simpler because then you should just be greedy. Right? The, the value captures the long-term consequences. So then you just take actions which maximize the value. Um, and there's an iterative relationship known as the Bellman um, equation, which says that the um, the long-term consequences are the immediate reward plus the expected long-term consequences of the state I end up in if I followed my policy, right? Um, and that, you, you can arrive at that pretty straightforwardly by um, looking at the summation here and uh, kind of writing out these two terms. You'll see that the only difference between this term and this term is this, this reward here. Um, so to make that a bit more concrete, because um, uh, I just wanted to show you. Uh, so this is a very simple um, MDP or environment. So imagine we, we have this world where we start in this state S. So each of these circles is a state. Each of these arrows is an action. And then the, the numbers are the reward you get for taking this action, right? Um, so can everyone tell me, like, if you start in this state, uh, what should you do? Like if you if you want to get the highest return, yeah. yeah go to D and then to E. Yeah, so even though immediately you actually get a negative reward, right? You care about the long term consequences, um, and so it's clear that you should go here. Oh, and this like this is to deal with termination. So I'm just saying once you get here, you you absorb, like you kind of terminate the episode, or you you sum to zero. Um, and so, and, and then to show you the policy dependence, what I've done here is put the approximate um, values for a Q under two policies. So one is random, and one is the, under the optimal policy. So if we start with the optimal policy, we can see that, um, okay, if you're in state B, uh, and you go, then um, you go right, and you get 100, right? So that's why um, the value here is 100. Um, and uh, we leave the top value for now. And if you're in this state and you go right, um, you're going to get, this is this Bellman equation, you're going to get minus 1, but then 100, right? And you know you're going to go right here because this is the optimal policy. And you know that under the optimal policy, you'll always choose to go right. So this is why um, in this state, S, if we, the value of going right is 99. Because um, we know that, uh, yeah, you're going to go, if we keep following the optimal policy, we're going to end up in E straight away. However, under the random policy, it has a very different value, right? Because 
Um, if we're in this state and we go B, but then we randomly choose what to do next, there's only like a 50% chance that we're going to take the optimal action. So the value of going right um, is much lower. Um, it's not 50 because there's also, even if we take the make a mistake and come back, there's still a good chance that we're going to return here. Um, does that all kind of conceptually make sense? Yeah. And you can see, um, <laughs> like, even if you just know the random value, that if you then greedily followed this, um, you would do much smarter than a random actions, right? If you just in every state, you look at what's the best value action, even if after the state I take random actions, um, you're already going to get a pretty decent policy. So um, learning this action value function is uh, kind of um, simplifies basically the problem considerably. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and then more concretely, obviously, we want to do things like control high dimensional robots from video cameras or something. Um, and so, uh, you know, we can't just build these like tables because we don't have a finite set of states. Our state is, say, like every possible image we can receive on the camera. So then this is where the neural networks come in. Um, and the kind of the, the central element we're going to look at is uh, this is called uh, like TD0, temporal difference zero learning. It's, Every time we take, we are in a state and we take an action, we receive a reward and we end up in another state. So this gives us a tuple like this, right? We were in this state, we took this action, we got this reward, and we ended up in this other state, right? Um, and so we want to learn the, uh, a function which approximates Q under a certain policy. Um, and so this is our estimator of the true value of Q. Right? It's the reward we received. So this comes from the Bellman equation. It's the reward we received plus the value of the next state if we take an action. Oh, I think I'm missing a bracket there. If we take our action um, from our current policy. Right? That, that just directly, um, again, writing out the Bellman equation. But now the expectation has disappeared. And the reason the expectation has disappeared is because this is a single sample. Right? So, the expectation comes in that we do this many times, and then we get an approximate um, value. Uh, so, th um, so this, you know, this is an equation we can solve. And then here is our estimate, which in our case is a neural network. So here's the theta is back again. This is the weights of the neural network. Um, and here's the loss. Oh, that should have a square on it. Sorry. Um, I thought I corrected that. Uh, so, the, so our loss function is just the squared error. Um, imagine there's a two there. Um, and uh, you know, so now we use what we said at the beginning. We have a way to learn um, the action value with a large neural network just by minimizing this loss given enough of these samples. Does that make sense? Any questions? No? OK. Um, However, oh, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. However, so in some sense, this is all, all that DQN is at its most basic level, the, the, the one that you saw playing uh, Space Invaders. That's all you need to do. Because once you learn this, right, then there's a simple policy, which is um, kind of like, like this, where in, in, a, in Atari, we only have nine actions or 18 actions. So we, we learn a policy, and then <laughs> the way we, uh, sorry, we learn an action value function, and then our policy is just whatever state we're in, we compute the value of each of the possible choices of actions we have, and we take the best action, right? Um, and that, and then under this new policy, we recompute Q, and over time, it's going to converge um, to something near the optimal policy, or it's going to improve, right? It's, does that make sense? Like if here, this is the random policy, but we create a new policy by in every situation being greedy, then we're going to get a much better policy, and we can recompute Q under that new policy and iteratively go back and forth. Um, however, that's not going to work for our situation. Um, and I kind of already told you why. Does anyone paying attention knows why? <laughs> exactly. Right. So we need a different way to improve the policy because we can't just search all the, we can't compute the value of all the actions. And so, um, sorry. Uh, so we improve the policy, and um, although the proof that this uh, converges in the linear case is complicated, it's actually, again, just the chain rule. Um, so 
the way we improve our policy, so now our policy itself is a neural network. Um, so it maps, policies map from a state to an action. And so given our action value function, we can improve our policy by essentially minimizing, it's a bit convoluted to write it like this, but I tried to write it as a loss, which just says for a given state, we compute what our policy would recommend. So the action that we would currently choose if we were in that state. And then we compute the gradient on the action value with function, right? So we, um, we use the chain rule to compute the gradient of according to our action value function, what direction should we change our actions in order to improve the policy and um, make, make the actions it chooses a higher value. Um, and that, that's the policy improvement step. Is that clear? Uh, okay, and then um, reinforcement learning kind of uh, stress tests neural networks because it's sort of, um, it's not the ideal situation that most of the neural network theory uses because um, in general, uh, the way you compute these things is um, you want data that's independent and identically distributed, meaning if you have a data set, you shuffle it randomly um, so that when you take small samples, um, they d they're uncorrelated. Um, and the other issue is that we need to make sure we explore sometimes, right? Otherwise, we might, not, we might miss out on a reward just because we, we, we kind of greedily start thinking we found the best thing already. Um, and so the way we deal with both of these problems is we, uh, we take our current policy. So um, you can think of this as kind of two different, it can actually be running on two different machines if you want, or like this could be a, a machine controlling a real robot. So firstly, we randomly initialize our policy network and our action value network. So we don't know anything about the world. Then on, on, the, on the one machine, we uh, interact with the environment by choosing something according to our current policy and then adding some noise to that action um, just to make sure we explore. So we try new things. Um, and then you know, we, we receive a reward in a new state um, from the environment. And we put this in a replay table, which is, can be in memory or on disk or something. Um, and then the learning algorithm, we sample tuples like this from the replay table. So this replay table helps distribute our data because we don't learn immediately because you can imagine if you learned online then everything is very correlated right like um, the state you were just in is might be very similar to the state you're in now so by using this replay table we get some of this shuffling um, we sample a tuple and then we take two steps we do the action value update that's we improve our estimate of the value of um, this state under these actions and then we do the policy improvement step where we say okay in this state given my current policy, how can I improve my current policy? Uh, and we run that a bunch of times um, until it uh, converges. I should note that with these neural networks, there's no proof of um, convergence, but in general, like, they are relatively stable. Uh, any questions? Uh, yeah. So in, in, in the example of the Atari game, for example, is there um, a, a stack of policies? So let's say shooting the um, starships and then um, gaining points and um, you know are these coded in there or is it just one general uh, policy function there? It's uh, okay. It's a good point. So in the original paper, um, they trained separate weights for each game. So there's, I mean, in some sense, that's a separate policy for each game. So the uh, the algorithm is identical between games, but the learned behavior is very different. Um, more recently. The other, I, I think maybe the Nature paper evaluates this. I don't remember. Um, a more challenging version of this task is to take like the 50 Atari games and make the same neural network play them all. Um, and that generally lowers your scores a bit, um, but that is relatively successful now. And it kind of implicitly learns different policies just by identifying from the screen. So it doesn't get told you're in game one, you're in game two, but you, know, you can just see that these two screens look different and learn that you should adjust your behavior. Does that answer the question? Uh, so last year in 2017, uh, I went to the first conference on robotic learning. Um, and Rodney Brooks, who some of you probably know is a very famous MIT professor of robotics, uh, gave the opening keynote where he more or less said, uh, you know, um, so I work at, he works in industry now. And he says, you know, he's been to lots of factories. 
he sells a he's also a f- co-founder of iRobot which sells the Roomba and he said you know don't get too smug because literally I've never seen any of your algorithms ever in use anywhere like uh, so you know um, we have these algorithms um, and yet at the first conference on robotic learning the basic message was they're they haven't succeeded yet they're um, they're nowhere in use um, and so this part is a bit more speculative, so if you fell asleep earlier, you can maybe wake up. Um, uh, and so I want to talk about, you know, why is that? Like, why we have algorithms, we have robots. Um, why are there no robots really in use that are using learning? So there's, of course, robots in use, but almost all of uh, industrial robots or even like home robots like the Roomba, they are largely not, not using learning algorithms. Um, they maybe sometimes use a, a supervised network for perception, but largely in, in practice, there's very few cases where um, they're using learning algorithms. And I'm going to argue that, that there's multiple reasons for this. Um, and this is, you know, my own uh, thoughts and people disagree. But so first thing, I'm going to start by arguing, actually, we should blame someone else, not, not uh, the, the algorithm people, that actually the mechanics and cost constraints of robots are, are very limiting right now, and it makes safety very difficult. Uh, and I'll, I'll go into that in more detail. Um, I'm going to argue that we need transfer learning, which basically means you learn, you, you improve at other tasks from experiencing the first task. I go into that in more detail. Uh, designing the reward function can be very hard. Um, it's very, it can be very hard to capture all the things we care about. Um, and uh, yeah, it's very difficult to provide safety guarantees. And I, another thing that uh, uh, a lot of algorithms still struggle with right now, although we have some solutions that they aren't necessarily that scalable, is um, dealing with large amounts of memory. So, you know, you guys came here today and you remember like all sorts of things, where you put your code, uh, where the train station was, and uh, a lot of, you know, and this, this a lot of tasks, I mean, even just things like you remember if something is behind uh, a curtain, you know that it's still there. Um, and a lot of our algorithms, they do, there is approaches that deal with memory, memory right now, um, but in general, they haven't been that scalable. They, they deal with only small amounts of memory, not the many items that you guys can remember. Okay. Uh, What's POMP DPS? Oh, yeah. Um, so that's like the formal um, uh, formalization of memory, which it means, so if you remember MDPs where um, I said there's a state that must uh, like fully describe the environment. So a POMP DP means you don't get access to the state itself. So that would be like, I know the true state of the world. You instead get access to an observation which conditioned on that state. And so that's um, the formalism we use. And that kind of forces you to have some kind of memory, right? Because you need to, well, I, either in some simple situations, you can use um, like simple filtering to, to get an optimal estimate of the state. But in general, you somehow need to remember the past to make inferences. Um, and if we have time, which I don't think we will, I can go into like an extension to DPG that tries to solve this. Okay, and one of the things um, that people have emphasized in learning robotics is data efficiency. So, um, so uh, you know, in supervised neural networks, often the data sets are huge. Um, you know, you, it's relatively easy to assemble if you want to do like image recognition. Um, nowadays with the internet and stuff, to assemble millions of images, um, sometimes even billions, or, or other, you can imagine other um, tasks where it's quite easy to assemble a huge amount of supervised data. If Amazon wants to make a recommendation engine, you know, they have all of the interactions on Amazon website for the past 20 years. That's a huge data set. You get many, many examples. Um, but in robotics, when we want to teach a robot a new task, like, you know, um, uh, generally people have very much emphasized data efficiency um, that we want to make the robot learn very rapidly. And the comparison point they, they often make is that, okay, if I, you know, if I ask you a new task that you've never done before, like stack these chairs, right, probably you can do it with zero <coughs> um, examples and, z and like immediately. But even not, even if, uh, even if um, I need to demonstrate because maybe they don't stack very easily and there's some sophisticated way you need to, to assemble them, um, it's usually like you, you can watch me do it once, maybe twice, and then you're going to be able to copy me. From, from most, and here I'm emphasizing because I think one of the central challenges of robotics um, is, is actually very basic tasks, the kinds of things that um, we can learn very quickly. So, you know, obviously if you're trying to do like circus acrobatics, 
this takes a lot longer, but a lot of the tasks that we want robots to do are things that, you know, you can teach someone to do in like one or two examples. Um, and so there's been a strong emphasis, like, okay, how do we make our algorithms more data efficient? Um, and I want to argue, uh, based on these puppies and some more animal videos, that actually that's a little bit misguided and really what we should be focusing on is transfer learning. Um, and so in other words, premature, we shouldn't focus too much on data efficiency just yet. Um, and to give you an example, uh, hopefully these videos play. Uh, here's a toddler who maybe just learned to walk, uh, looks up in the sky, and falls over. Uh, and here is, you know, I think some of you have probably seen this, here's some robots falling over. It's always fun. Uh, humanoid robots. So this is the kind of thing that we'd like to do learning on, right? And uh, so here is where I argue that, um, so what are some differences you notice here? Anyone? No one notices that these are the same? So they're really substantially different situations. Um, so one is, one is that often you maybe don't notice immediately, is that you can't be anywhere near these robots. They weigh 400 kg, right? Like you don't want to be around when they lose their footing. That will kill you or hurt you, right? You, you don't mind being around a toddler when they fall over. Uh, it's not usually going to damage you too much. Um, also, these robots are very rigid. Toddlers are, have uh, quite um, shock-absorbing bones. They, they have typically developed quite a bit of fat, so they um, are basically cushioned. Um, and so they can fall over a lot and it doesn't matter too much as long as it's, you know, as long as it's not a long distance or something like, um, and they're, you know, even if they do damage themselves a little bit, uh, they're self-repairing like within bounds. Uh, you know, you sh recently we had snow in London and uh, I discovered that uh, push scooting and ice don't mix very well. And, you know, it's not that expensive to repair. I just wait it out and it gets better. And I've now learned from that example. Um, uh, but, you know, these robots are typically very heavy, very rigid, um, and, and break relatively easily. So this is partly why people have cared so much about data efficiency and learning is because, um, you know, it's actually really, really expensive data to collect. Um, and just to emphasize right, uh, that there's, you know, there's actually people who videotape toddlers learning to walk. Um, and they are not that data efficient. I mean, part of it is muscle development, so part of it is the physical development, but a lot of it is actually learning. So they, they, they videoed toddlers paying in a preschool, or uh, sorry, at home, and they found that the average toddler learning to walk falls down 17 times an hour, um, and, uh, and often does this for about six hours a day. Um, uh, and, you know, so uh, often for like, say, a year or something. And even then, their walking is not that stable, right? So that's a lot of falls. And you can't do that with a rigid 400 kg robot unless you're prepared to spend a lot of money on repairs. Um, and that's just for, you know, that's just for walking, right? Obviously, you know, toddlers are dropping things and learning, you know, we give them plastic glasses and stuff be long, and, uh, long after they learn to walk. So we actually get to spend a lot of time in safe environments. Um, and, you know, just to emphasize this even more, I like it because it affects both humans and animals, um, that uh, baby animals are, are like relative, are, are definitely exploring and they're not that smart about safety either, right? Like the NHS guidelines and, you know, as we all know, you don't leave kids unattended, right? Um, and we build special devices to make sure they can't fall too far. Um, uh, and so, you know, this shows this idea that, uh, yeah, that we get a lot of data and we're actually not that smart about exploration until we experience the world a bit. But the big difference is, of course, um, that we're not like this now, right? Uh, most of you can be left unsupervised around stairs, <laughs> unless you're drunk. Um, and, and really the proof that this is really necessary, I think, is that um, in general, evolutionarily, we are quite energetically constrained, right? Like most, I mean, nowadays we, we struggle with obesity, but in evolutionary terms, we generally were um, very worried about energy consumption. And so most animals are, are not that wasteful of energy, right? Um, and yet, we see that animals as well go to like some effort and waste enormous amounts of energy, especially when they're young, 
on, um, on trying things. Uh, so here you can see these um, wolves are play fighting, right? This is, and, and this is clearly matters because later on, they're gonna have to take on this buffalo. And here, buffaloes are dangerous to wolves. Here, a mistake can cost them their lives. And so, um, you know, I think it's notable that even in animals, which, you know, have very limited energy, they still have like something we might call playful behavior and they spend a lot of um, time doing it, especially when they're young. Um, and they have adaptations. Like for example, these, these um, wolves are, will not be biting each other with the full strength of their, their mouth. Like they, they know this is a playful situation where you practice fighting, but you don't damage each other. Um, and so this shows that, you know, like we definitely evolved to um, spend a lot of time exploring. Okay, yeah. And um, so robots are expensive and brittle. Um, I think the, the Roboy was renting for like 5,000 euro a day. Um, um, whereas, uh, yeah, humans are amazing. They're intelligent, um, strong, extremely dexterous, um, socially and physically um, strong. So even a lot of robots uh, cannot lift what an adult human can lift, for example. They're self-repairing. Um, and I think, um, you know, there's a huge, enormous, and I think maybe the HPP is, is interesting because I think it's bringing together different fields. I think there's enormous scope for um, improvements in mechatronics and mechanics to, to achieve um, more playful behavior, um, like vast amounts of uh, play, playful behavior. Um, and another approach, which I won't go into too much, which has seen some success and is debated whether it's a good idea or not, is um, sim to real. So, Another way you can deal with this situation is obviously simulated worlds are, are relatively cheap and robots don't break in simulation. Um, so there has been a lot of research in recent times of one approach to getting this data is to make simulations which are, are like as accurate as possible, um, like you have uh, very good rendering systems now. Um, and so it, it's debated whether, I, I think it's an open question whether we're going to be able to collect some of this data in simulated worlds um, and therefore be really data efficient on real robots or whether, um, yeah, whether we're kind of forced to, to deal with real robots right from the beginning. Um, and I guess another, yeah, another thing is, as well as robots being expensive and brittle, is just the, the mean time between failure, right? Like we have amazing number of um, degrees of freedom. Like our hands are, are you know, incredibly dexterous. Um, they have very, if you are buying them for a robot, very expensive sensing systems. Um, and they're very robust. They can they can grip, they have high grip strength, um, and and they go for you know years without breaking. Um, and most robots with the you know, robot hands, they don't have the same grip strength. They don't have as many sensors, and they break like sometimes you know weekly. Um, and so this is I think all mechanical challenges, which I think will lead to interesting uh, research if we can um, attack some of these things, and also. Um, I think that it's a, uh, sorry, it's a um, back and forth relationship. I mean, one of the reasons that there's, there's not that many robots with really high degree of freedom hands right now is that actually um, the algorithms for controlling such things have been relatively limited until recently. Um, so there's not much point in building a robot that you can't control. So I think like there's a lot of scope for, for um, interaction between disciplines to allow us to attack some of these problems. Uh, yeah, so we need, um, we need a preschool for robots, uh, safe environments with supervision and lots of interesting things. Um, one advantage of robotics, though, that we, we don't have um, in humans is that uh, it's very easy, you know, kind of we can, we can transfer brains between bodies, right? So, like, we, we only need one robot to go to preschool, um, and then the rest can, like, uh, you know, can share what it's learned. Um, but the other thing that uh, I'm going to discuss is that, uh, you know, in order for robots to be useful, we can't have preschool for every task. We need transfer learning. We need um, algorithms which can, given lots of free data, lots of exploration in a safe environment, can then learn how to quickly adapt and learn in other environments. Um, and I'm going to discuss one preliminary approach for doing this called successive features. Um, and a subsidiary challenge is that it's been very challenging. It's related to transfer. Is um, it's been very challenging if you have multiple tasks to make sure that forgetting doesn't occur. So that's um, kind of the inverse of transfer learning, where um, you want to make sure that when you learn a new task, you don't forget how to do an old task, or at least you don't forget too badly. Yeah. Um, another thing of safety, again, um, uh, is right now 
neural networks in general, and maybe RL in particular, it's very hard to provide the kind of safety guarantees that we want. Um, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of successive neural networks have been in areas where mistakes are relatively um, uncostly, like in speech recognition, or in um, image search or something, or image recognition. You know, if I mislabel a photo in your photo album, it's a bit of a pain, but it's not catastrophic. Um, whereas, you know, if we put robots into factories and, and so forth, um, and they're interacting near humans, then obviously we want to be able to provide much stronger guarantees about their behavior. And uh, one of the things I think that um, we're, there's again research being done, but we haven't really captured very well, is that most of our loss functions, we focus on the mean, meaning that we, we say like across all of these examples, make sure that the errors are not too high. But it does mean that sometimes um, we, you can learn solutions where it's very good on almost all the examples, and then on some examples it does catastrophically bad. And that shows up, that doesn't really show up here because we just sum it all. Um, whereas actually we care about much more than just the mean um, behavior, we also care about the variance, right? We, um, and I think that like, understanding how we can um, try and improve some of these guarantees is a very interesting area of research. Um, yeah, and so, uh, I don't know how to make it. So, um, and I, I do think that, uh, so all of this is to say that interacting with the real world, I think, is a really interesting uh, problem because it's a stress test of what it means to understand. Um, and just to give you an example, like I, I'm sure many of you know that there's been a lot of success making neural networks caption images. So this is like a, a neural network was able to look at this image and, and capture uh, something about it by generating this sentence. Um, however, uh, you, you know, I, I think for, it sometimes gives us the mistaken impression um, of the, the level of um, understanding of this scene because we, we would assume that if a human answers this question, like gives us this description, they probably actually know what these words mean, right? Like they could answer questions about, um, you know, will the elephants move to a, a field with uh, um, greener grass or, or things like this. They really like have a, you know, in, in, the way they, that we um, caption this image is actually by understanding the image quite deeply. And I, I think um, it's, it's sometimes easy, like uh, there's been a lot of evidence that these, these captioning systems rely heavily on language models and um, context and don't necessarily have the depth of understanding we have. And I think this is why um, interacting with the real world where you have to actually not just describe things, but pick them up, move them, um, requires us to reason about how objects to decompose the world, uh, um, sometimes even to deal with adversarial examples. So I think it's a, a really interesting area of research because it will um, stress these differences. Uh, and I'm just going to end by one uh, very um, simple approach to transfer learning, which uh, has seen some successes. Uh, so to formally, um, we can think of transfer learning like this. Instead of having a single task, now we have a distribution over tasks. And each trial, we sample one of these tasks. Um, and in the sequential case, um, what we want to have is that Again, this is like the preschool. We want that once you've seen some tasks, that um, the learning on the other tasks should become much faster. Um, we don't, and uh, so that's transfer learning. And one approach to this, um, which actually originates uh, from Peter Diane in the 90s, um, and more recently, uh, so work uh, I was involved in with a colleague has kind of made a, a uh, more scalable version of this. Um, we have kind of a variant of DPG that that works with like this is, um, is the big assumption we make, and I'll come back to this <coughs> assumption, is that we assume that the reward is decomposable, um, the reward for a specific task is decomposable into some vector of features um, and then a linear weighting over that vector. Um, and, uh, and so because of that assumption, then when we write out the the definition of the action value function, this linearity lets us pull out this linear weighting. And so now this expectation is, over, is a um, vector. So it's the expected features you're going to see. And then we can compute the value of this policy under this weighting just by taking the dot product of that vector um, with the weighting.
Any questions? Uh, and so what this allows us to learn is a set of policies and a corresponding what we call phi's, um, which is just this weighting. So then q's can be computed like this, right? Um, so, uh, so this function outputs a vector, and then uh, of the feature of the expected sum of features we're going to see, and then this says, well, under this weighting, this is how valuable those features are. Um, and so, uh, whoops. so what that allows us to do is we can compute a set of we can learn a set of policies, um, like have multiple policies and multiple size. And then for each psi, under a, under a new regime, under a new weighting, we can very easily compute which policy we should f is going to be the best to follow under this new weighting. Um, and so here's like a very uh, simple experiment um, result. So here is just a two-dimensional arm. And the idea is that um, it needs to reach for um, so there's four possible tasks during training. It has to reach for the blue goal, the red goal, uh, the purple, or the green. So it gets a reward of um, it gets a reward when it is able to reach the goal. Um, and the idea here is um, is that you can see. So what's happening here is it sees first the first task, then the second, then the third, then the fourth. So by this point in training, at one, it's only ever tried to reach for this red goal, but it's seen features about how how um, it's seen features about the world. And so, with DQN, um, which are these dotted lines, sorry, task one. With DQN, what's happened is, after you've seen the first task, it's very successful at solving task one, right? So the dotted red line is basically this one is like optimal performance. So the dotted red line is at one. However, it basically doesn't do at all well at any of the other tasks, right? Because it has no idea how to generalize or transfer what it knows about reaching here to reach to these other locations. Whereas with the successive features, you can see that um, these three other colored lines, even though you've never actually trained on them, it's already doing pretty well at these other tasks. Like it, it has some guess about how to um, reach to other positions in the environment just by solving the first task. And then as you solve more and more tasks, gets better and better. And in particular, it also lets you transfer to new tasks that you never saw during training. So this is the average performance on reaching to all of these gray locations, where the gray locations are ones you never saw during training. And again, you can see that um, successive features, it's definitely not getting optimal, right? It's not doing perfectly, but it's doing much better um, than it would have than, than uh, DQN, which doesn't have this conceptualization of transfer. Sorry? Who did it? Uh, so this is Andre Burrito as the first author. Um, it's a deep mind, and I, so I was involved in some of these experiments. Um, yeah, so the limitations of, I, I think success features have been a, a really interesting idea. Um, I guess they haven't really, they're not yet demonstrated really in a scalable manner. I mean, you can see that, that a task is relatively simple, um, and I think one of the things is this assumption of linearity of the reward is a, is a big assumption. And, and um, uh, yeah, there's many questions about how to extend this. But I think it's an interesting idea. So another thing is like the, the performance of these things depends really heavily on the features you use. And at the moment, we just give it features like based on spatial locations. But obviously, um, you know, we'd like to be able to learn what features we should use. Um, and I think also. There's questions about uh, when do you know when it's time to add a new policy? Like, um, so at the moment, again, we sort of tell it you're going to see four different tasks. Um, and I think it would be more interesting if it's able to figure out when it should add uh, new policies. And this would let it do um, lifelong learning. Um, yeah, and I think I'll just end there and skip to the end. with. Um, yeah, thanks for listening, and uh, thanks to many of my I'll get to you in a second. Thanks to many of my colleagues at DeepMind, and I didn't really talk about the work, but also at BrainCorp for many like interesting conversations and uh, stimulation.